in this 24th session of Look at the Book on Romans 8. We'll focus on verse 29, especially what it means to be foreknown by God. So, Father, as we take up this most weighty of all matters, almost, in the Bible, grant us humility and wisdom to discern what's really here. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why is it that those who are called for sure have all things work together for their good? Answer in this word for, because those whom he foreknew, he predestined, and those whom he predestined, he called. In other words, the reason the called have everything work together for their good is because behind the call is predestination unto conformity to the image of God's Son and glorification. Therefore, it is as certain as the predestination is, and behind the predestination is a foreknowing, and that's what I want to understand. What does it mean that behind our destination to conformity to the image of God's Son and glorification, there is this foreknowing. And I'll just put two possibilities out there and show why I think one is biblical. So first would be to say that it is God's foreseeing our self-determined, self-determined faith. Now, the reason I put it like that is because the view that I'm representing there is very concerned that in the doctrine of predestination, humans lose their power of ultimate self-determination. God becomes the one who finally decides who is called and who is justified and who is glorified, not us in our self-determining powers of will by which faith is produced. And in order to preserve that, they say, in order to preserve man's self-determination in the producing of his own faith and thus his own justification, they say this is the rescue. This is how God did it. God saw ahead of time that we would produce self-determining, self-determined faith, and then on the basis of what he foresaw, namely our own self-determination, he predestined us to these good things. So we remain the decisive cause of our justification and glorification. Now, I'm going to suggest that doesn't work. Put a big X beside it because as you trace the thought in the next verses, it rules out the possibility of self-determined faith. We saw this already. Verse 30, those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified. So God intends for the predestined to be justified. How can he secure and be sure that they'll all be justified if justification is always by faith? How can that happen? And the answer is, he does it by inserting this step in the process. He causes all the predestined to be called, which we said is a calling into being of faith. It's the creation of faith. That's why all the called are justified, because all the called believe. And the reason all the called believe is because the call itself creates the faith. So there is no such thing in this passage as a self-determining faith. It doesn't exist. Faith exists because of the divine and sovereign call of God. So what is the other possibility for the meaning of for no, and I'm going to suggest it means choose. 
He chose us, and on the basis of that choosing, he predestined us. And he chose us not on the basis of foreseen, self-determined faith, but on the basis of nothing in ourselves. Now, where in the world do I get that idea? Because you look at it in English, and it doesn't look like the word chose. So let's do a little background work here to see if this is a possible, indeed, necessary interpretation. In 1 Corinthians 8.3, we've already seen, if anyone loves God, he has been known by God. He has been known by God. So being known by God comes first, and this is possible because of this. We love God because we've been known by God. So being known by God is some... It's not recognizing our pre-existing love for God. It awakens and enables our love for God, and I would argue our faith. Look how it works in the Old Testament. Now, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore a son. This is sexual intercourse, which means this... This word no is chosen here as a kind of euphemism to show that it has the meaning of, I choose to take you in to my most intimate relationship. Or here's verse uh, chapter 18. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I have chosen And the word in Hebrew is known. That's what the King James still has. This is ESV. The King James says, I have known him that he may command his children. So the original has no, and it means I have have taken him in. I have chosen him for my very special possession. Here's Amos chapter 3 verse 2. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel. You only have I known. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Well, he knows the families of the earth in the sense that he knows their existence and everything about them. But he he only has known Israel in the sense that he, he chose her. He took her into his most intimate knowing. Here's Psalm 1, 5, same usage. The wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Well, the Lord knows the way of the wicked in the sense that he knows all about the way of the wicked, but he knows the way of the righteous in that he acknowledges it and he chooses it and embraces it and draws it in to his affirmation. So, we come back here. It is not Strange at all to say that Paul would use the word for no, for choose ahead of time. To confirm that, ask this question. Well, if, if that is in fact what he means, why didn't he just say it? Because there is a Greek word for choose. Why didn't he say he chose or he forechose? And here's my suggestion for why. Because not only is he explaining why the called will have all things work together for their good, he's explaining why those who love God have all things work together for their good. And, and what's the answer to why those who love God experience this certainty of all things working for their good? And here in 1 Corinthians 8.3, it says, because anyone who loves God has been known by God. So in Paul's mind, the structure of knowing, preceding, and enabling love is not new here. They love God. So in Paul's mind, they've been known by God, that is, chosen by God. So the upshot of this is twofold. One would be um, to say, Man is responsible to know and love the truth of God. All of it that's available to him in the world. And man is guilty 
wherever, whenever he doesn't. He doesn't know it, blinds himself to it, or doesn't believe it, love it. And that's all of us. We're all rejected and suppressed the truth of God. But God does not give man decisive control over salvation. It remains a free, undeserved gift, which means that we are utterly humbled and there is no boasting possible for any of the freely chosen elect, and we are made debtors and servants to all because we're no better than they. Our choosing was before we did anything to deserve it, and it was, in fact, in the light of our not deserving it, which means no boasting, total humility, and much service.